Tonight we are learning uh, Le'ila Nishmas, Avram ben Chaim Yehuda, Yechaskel ben Avram, Meir ben Mordechai Tzvi, Moshe ben Baruch, and of course all the Kedoshim, the 45 Kedoshim that uh, passed away uh, one week ago on uh, Lage Baimer. The I was thinking about if I should speak about this topic or not. Uh, when you go on, let's say, Torah anytime, there's hundreds, of, probably by now, of, of classes on this. And I was like, what is going to make a difference? What I'm going to say as well, I'm probably going to reiterate on what other people already said. And especially, you know, I'm actually going to be quoting a lot of the G'daylam over here. There's not, nothing else that I could say myself other than what the G'daylam say. But I was thinking as I was scrolling through all those people, the speakers that were speaking on Torah anytime on this subject, I was thinking, you know, if I were to go and start listening, I would listen to the people that I usually listen to, the people that I like to listen to. And I was, you know, thinking, so just because there's hundreds of classes doesn't mean that everybody's listening to that because people, everybody has their own speakers that they like, everybody has their own connection. So I felt that it was incumbent, you know, uh, maybe I, I require to speak a little bit upon this, you know, subject for the people that listen to our classes. So with that, I decided that I wanted to, to speak on this subject again. Nothing that I'm bringing here is my own ideas or opinions. These are all based on what the Gedolim are telling us nowadays. It's been quite some time since, and, and especially if you look in Eretz Israel and Israel, they're, they've been cooped up for more than a year, well over the year, and there was no large gatherings. There was no, everybody was stuck in their homes for a very, very long time. And then suddenly, finally, this is like the big opening, the finally the grand reopening of Israel, if we could call it, that where you have the, one of the first largest gathering that we had, hundreds of thousands of people are coming together the post-COVID world. And unfortunately, what ended up happening is, as the news are calling it, Israel's worst civilian disaster since Israel was, funded, it was founded as a, um, you know, as a state, uh, you know, back that 70, 80 years ago. And unfortunately, what happened was that we had 45 Kedoshim, really holy people. You know, there's always times where there's different attacks and we call people holy because of that. But these are people, literally, you look at them, children, Rabbanim, you know, parents, they, you know, really holy people, really, really holy people that passed away in such a holy place on such a holy time. And it begs people to start questioning what, what's going on over here. And, and even for the people that were in the situation where you hear people screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And there's, not, there's one thing that's scarier when someone's screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And that's when they stop screaming, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, because they were no longer here. The, the trauma, the, 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 I didn't even know the words that I could, I could say, the people that, that you know, went through. It's unfortunate right now in the Jewish nation, there's, over 60 orphans, 18 widows. There's a, a, you're talking an approximate number of over 600 men, women, and children that are sitting Shiva. And that doesn't include the relatives, the distant relatives. It doesn't include the friends, the neighbors, the yeshivas of everybody. And, and really, when you look at it, the entire Klal Yisrael, the entire Jewish nation is feeling this. It really is feeling this. I've been getting you know, phone calls and questions like, what are we supposed to do during this time? Like, how do we understand this? Like, what's going on? People are like it's it's such a scary and i'll tell you why you know it's such a it's such a traumatic of course it's a traumatic event but unfortunately the jewish nation is used to traumatic events we're used to the fact that there's terrorist attacks unfortunately we're used to that where we have you know islamic extremists go out and they unfortunately do the worst of the worst and they destroy the jewish nation we're used to the fact that sometimes there is accidents, you know, there is car accidents, there is other ad types of accidents. You know, we're, we're used to all these traumatic events, but when was the last time that, you know, Rahman Sam, we had to deal with such a, a concept where the Jewish nation died and we're like, what happened? There was Jews amongst Jews and 
they, you know, in a holy place, in a holy time, there was no terrorist attack. There was no, act, there were, you could say whatever, there was acts. There's no car accident, there's no car bombs, there's no, no nothing. What was it? What was it? So it caused people to really have a concern, like, what's going on over here? Like, what are we supposed to, do? how are we even supposed to process this? Terrorist attack, unfortunately, we know how to process that. We, we have so many things, we were no, but, but how do we process something like this? How do we process something that we can't even put a finger on what it is? And when you're dealing with such a, it's not only this disaster, it's really really any disasters. You have, you have people that go to either extremes. You have some people that get depressed. They get depressed down, they get, they, they're stuck in bed all day, and they can't get out. And, you know, unfortunately, that's, that's the wrong, uh, we don't judge them. Again, we don't, uh, um, you know, there's, there's no judgment over here, but that's not the correct aspect to do it. Sadness, yes, of course. But the depression, it goes into one extreme, it's really, really problematic. Then you have the other extreme where you think, you hear about it, you're sad for an hour, a minute, a day maybe, and then you go for out with your business as usual. That's also not the appropriate response to it. So we have to think about what is the, the appropriate response that we have to deal with? What are the emotions that we're supposed to be having? What are the, you know, the, the things that we're supposed to be taking out of this? Such an such a incident. You know, you hear a lot of stories when um, you know post this and post any traumatic event you hear how, like people were like just two minutes ago they were right there and now they are no they they just left for whatever particular reason and i've heard i've spoken to people who personally were there five minutes ago ten minutes ago they were right there and then they just ha you know happened to leave there were parents that the children called them from the children were in israel the parents were in america and the children are saying we're going to this location and then the phone lines went down for an hour and a half and the parents heard what happened. Parents were already preparing the levayas of their children. And only later did it turn out with a tremendous amount of hashkacha pratis that, you know, they happened to go to this place and they happened to go to this location and they weren't there when it actually happened. And those are the stories that usually come out, the hashkacha, the amazing hashkacha that comes out. What's a little bit unfortunate, what's a little bit scarier is just like there's hashkacha for those people that didn't come out, and it's very difficult for me to say this. There's also hashgacha for those people that didn't make it. Those people that didn't get to leave, you know, uh, Meron at that time. There were over 100,000 people over there. Everybody was exactly where they needed to be. It wasn't by accident. There was a story that it was posted all over by, uh, it was, uh, there, there was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Victor Chayot. He was in Meron at the time with his, with his uh, children and his student and they were in that place and unfortunately his one of his children and one of his students didn't make it and there was a boy there by the name of Kobe and Kobe was a 20 year old yeshiva bachar from Bet Shemesh and he was there in the same area and he what he he saw there were people that were they were trying to get out and he tried to save them so he tried to go and pull them out but unfortunately he didn't know that instead of pulling them away from the I guess the the call of the situation he pushed them to the situation and they ended up passing away and he felt he, he couldn't get over his guilt he was beyond himself with his guilt he went and he paid a shiva called to this rabbi victor and he went and only as Kalali Sol could do it rabbi victor went and instead of worrying about his own suffering he just lost this child He's going, and for a half an hour, he is reassuring Kobe that, no, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. This is what Hashem wanted. But Victor had a 10-year-old son. His name was Shmuel. He was there at the same time. And you look, you see the video. The video was circulating. Shmuel gets, they're both on wheelchairs, post of what has happened. And they lost, one lost a brother, the other one lost a son. And this little 10-year-old boy sees Kobe, and Kobe sees him, and he starts crying again. He starts bursting out at the tears. And the little 10-year-old boy, he's mourning over the loss of his brother. And you know what he tells this Kobe? He says, this is what Hashem wanted. 10-year-old boy, look at that Muna that he has. He's like, this is what Hashem wanted. It, you know, it wasn't because of you. And then this little boy goes over to Kobe and he says, you saved me. He says, I am here today because of you. The father goes and says, listen, look at this. Children don't lie. A child doesn't lie. Don't worry, he was beyond himself. It, and Kobe goes afterwards and said, this is what gave me a little bit of, of Nechama. And you know what the father said something scary? He, he said something so true. He says, you know what? He says, at the end of the day, Maisha and Yedidya, which was his son, he says, they would have been unfortunately killed in any event. He says, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. You know, we're slowly getting out of the COVID world. We're hopefully slowly getting out of the COVID world. And during this, you know, Baruch Hashem, and we may continue this way, we didn't have 
as much uh, tragic news as we had in when this when when COVID first started and the amount of people that passed away. But right when it happened, people were were beside themselves, people that lost family members. Like, maybe I shouldn't have gone to this hospital. Maybe I shouldn't have gone to this, uh, you know, maybe I should have tried this treatment. And then maybe my relative, my friend, my neighbor would have still been alive. And we go and we overthink the past and we're trying to go and correct them. Maybe, maybe we could have done something different and this, this, this person would still have been alive. How many parents are going and saying, you know what, I, I wish I wouldn't have sent my kids there. I wish I wouldn't have sent my friend over there. I wish we would have stayed over here. We, we, we try to we just think that, you know, it's, it's because of us. And we think, no, this is the reason of why, why it happened. And maybe we could even say, you know what, maybe we were negligent. We saw that it was packed. Why did we go there? We should have gone somewhere else. You know, the, the aspect of, of negligence when it comes to, to this acceptance, this amuna and bitachan that we're dealing with, is we have to realize, and the Kalav Reva brings it down, that even though someone's negligent, if somebody passed away, that was predestined. That was not because of negligence, that wasn't because of guilt. That person would have died in any matter. The question is, to what extent does this negligence go? And people really beat themselves up. People really go and they can't move on you know, from this. And by the way, we're using it as this, uh, this you know, tragic event as, as a, a platform to speak about this. But really, this, these topics are true in any, in, in any event, in any topic. The Gemara and Chulin goes, and we mentioned this before, that how much, to what extent is, is everything orchestrated from above? And the Gemara and Chulin goes bring, and brings down that a person doesn't even bruise his finger. Bruising your finger, like poke your finger and, and it hurts a little bit. Unless it was announced from Shemaim, it was announced in Hebron. Everything, even to, this, to the smallest extent, and the Gemara Narachin goes and, and explains, and the Gemara Narachin, page 16b, goes and says, Ad Heichan, until where is this suffering? How, how far does the definition of suffering go? Like what constitutes the, the concept of suffering? And the Gemara brings down a few opinions. And these are opinions that you would never even think that you would say that these are sufferings. Like if someone had his clothing tailored and it didn't fit exact. If somebody wanted to ask somebody for hot water and instead they brought a cold water. If someone put on the shirt and they put it on backwards. If someone put the hands in the pocket, they wanted to take out a certain amount of coins. They wanted to remove three coins, but instead they only removed two. And he has to put his hand back in his pocket. That too is, um, that too is, is called suffering. Now, what's the chidush over here? What's this chidush of all these different, you know, like, okay, just say any little thing has suffering. Why are they using exactly these examples? And the answer is, is that when you deal with the first two examples, the tailored and the hot water, that has nothing to do with me. That has to do with the tailor, the person who brought me the water. But when you think about, I put my shirt on backwards, that's suffering. I stuck my hand in my pocket and I didn't feel around and know that I would be able to go and take the two, t- the, the three quarters that I want and I said I only picked up two. That's my fault. Why is that considered suffering? And the answer is, is because it doesn't matter how it comes from, whether it's you think it's your fault, whether it's not, it's still considered suffering. And that's why the Gemara, the, the, you know, the question is, is how do we know? that um, a, we know that a person has, if a person didn't get suffering in 40 days, they really have to look at themselves because what's going on over here? You really should have gotten something. And the question is why? Maybe he's very careful. Maybe he's always attentive when he puts on his shirt, he always makes on his shirt to put on the shirt the right way. Maybe when he sticks his hands in his pocket, he's always sure exactly what he's going to take. Maybe he goes to a bartender that makes sure that only gives him exactly what he requests. And when he goes to that tailor, he gets the most skilled tailor and it gives him exactly, always fit to the teeth every single time. And the answer is, it's not the tailor, it's not the bartender, it's not you who has a final say. This is the extent of what Hashkacha Pratis, divine providence, extends. And when a calamity, a disaster befalls a person or a nation, and if a person thinks that there's no divine cause, that's, they're, they're, they're not on the path of Judaism. Because everything is min ha-shamayim. Everything is, is, from, is from heaven. There's no such thing as, oh, if I would have done this and I should have done this. Yes, we should always learn from the past. Don't get me wrong. Don't go blindly and just say, okay, you know, like I'm always going to follow whatever it is that I want because everything's min ha No, we have to do our ishtadlas. But that's not the topic for today. But we have to realize that everything that happened, happened because it was divinely decreed. It was decreed already by Rosh Hashanah. This was already decreed of what will happen. And unfortunately, right when it happened, the way that it usually goes is people try to point the finger. Who could we put the blame on it? So it's the police's fault. They should have done blah, 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 because everyone knows exactly what they should have done. 
I know it's the government's fault because they let too many people in and they should have done this. It's technology's fault for whatever reason, right? It's people who aren't religious. That's who it's the fault. Oh no, you know what? It's the people that are too religious. That's who is the problem. It's the people that didn't wear masks, that did wear masks, that forgot to wear masks, that should have worn masks. People are going and they're trying to put the blame on somebody else. Everybody's always going to be like, no, it's that fault. You know why this happened? It's because the police didn't do X, Y, and Z. And granted, yes, we should look into it and it should, you know, Things need to be corrected. But stop trying to put the blame on someone else. That's not the correct way of looking at things. We always try to put the blame, in relationships also, we try to put the blame, it's their fault that this relationship is falling apart. No, it's their fault they did this and they said that, I did that. Forget it, stop. Stop for a second and trying to say, you know whose fault it was, it was theirs. We look at the news and we see an accident. It was a drunk driver, it was his fault. We see a suicide bombing, we have to beef up security. Be like, when you stop, when, when did you stop being religious? When, stop for a second. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is sending you this. God sent you this. This is a reason for it. Stop putting the blame on someone else. Stop thinking that you know better and you can figure out. Stop being Sherlock Holmes. You're not over there going investigating the situation. Okay? No one cares what I, everybody and their mother has an opinion. Everybody knows exactly what had happened. Really? We're not prophets. We're not son of prophets. We don't know why it happened. Stop saying if it would have been a different police officer, if it would have been a different government, we could have done blah, 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 barking like a chicken. It's not the correct way to look at it. We have to go, we have to focus, look at what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did. You know, Rav Biederman brings down a story from, from Michal Bear Weissmendel, where who tried to save many people from the, and he did save many people from the Holocaust, and he had a plan to go and save potentially more thousands of Jewish people from the Holocaust. But unfortunately, there were some irreligious American Jews who prevented this from happening, prevented it from happening. And he was devastated. And he went over to the Rebbe, Yosef Yitzhak of Lubavitch. And the Rebbe goes to him and he said, and he, and he explained the situation. The Rebbe said, and he says, and who, who did this to you? The Rebbe asked him. Who did all this to you? The Rebbe goes before he answers, he says, this too was from Hashem. The people that prevented this, people from being saved, yes, they will be punished because they have free will. But the results wouldn't have been any different. Hashem decreed this should happen. And he said this, this like completely took a different spin on the way that he saw things. There was a girl who had a, a, a very, very severe case of asthma. And uh, for people who, who deal with asthma, there's something called a nebulizer, where if you have an asthmatic attack, you have this nebulizer with medication inside and it comes out as a mist and you inhale it and it sort of extends, ex, expands your, your, um, your your lungs and, and we're in the situations of where uh, the lungs sort of constrict and makes it hard to breathe. So they had, the certain family had a young girl who had asthma, a very severe, severe um, case of asthma. And they had nebulizers all over the house just to be sure. And one night this girl had an asthmatic attack and the entire family was rushing, looking over for, for the nebulizers. They had three of them, they couldn't find one. They're looking all over the house, they couldn't find it. They called Hatsala, please come, the, the, you know, she's having a hard time breathing. Unfortunately, by the time Hatsala came, the girl already moved on to the next world. And the family, only afterwards, they looked under the bed and they saw there the three nebulizers. And they were beside themselves. And they could, like, why didn't we look there? We could have had, our daughter, our sister could have still been alive. Why didn't we go? Why didn't we look there? Rav Yaakov Galinsky came to be Menachem Avom. And he told him that whatever happened, whatever occurred was exactly as Hashem planned. There's nothing that you could have done to change it. It's not the person who put it there's fault. It's not the person that should have looked there's fault. No one's guilty over here. The, 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 there is a reason why this happened. It happened because of Akadish Baruch. Akadish Baruch wanted this to happen. And when we think like this, we think, okay, if Akadish Baruch wanted this to happen, so should we go and should we, you know, be sad even to a certain extent? Of course, this is a question that's, you know, a, a idiotic question. But there was a there was a rabbi that go, that went and said that he was telling his chassidim that the entire world isn't worth one krechts, one moan. Our destiny is the next world. This world, stop, don't worry about this world too much. Don't moan, don't krechts, don't bot, don't worry about this world too much. It's about the next world. Just then, as he's, about, as he's speaking about this, a bench near him, near this Rebbe broke, and the Hasidim fell down, they were injured, but the Rebbe was also hit, and he was also injured. And the Rebbe emitted a sort of a krechts, a moan, because of the pain. So as Hasidim, 
they analyze everything and they say, you know, Rebbe, why are you crafting? Why are you moaning? He says, didn't you say that the world isn't worth a, a moan? Why are you doing it? So the Rebbe answered, he says, it's exactly right. He says, the world isn't worth a moan, isn't worth a krecht. But when it hurts, one shouts from pain. What are you going to do? When it hurts, you shout. That's all that you could do. The base of of Gur goes and explains this, and he says that it's natural for us to moan. It's natural for us to see, feel sad. It's natural for us to mourn over this. And we rightfully, we should, we should, we definitely should. But even during this time, we have to use our mind, our intellect, that we should remember that this world isn't what's important, it's the next world that's, you know, that's important. And that is why when people go and they experience the pain, the suffering, many people ask why. And in Hebrew, why is Lama? Lama, why did this happen? Why, why, why is God doing this? But really, the correct way of saying it is not Lama, why, but Lema, for what? For what? You're turning the question into something more constructive. What does Hashem want from me now? The Rebbe Nitzar Rebbe, one time he was walking and he fell down. And he fell down and he stayed down. And the, the Hasidim were running over to him and says, You know, Rebbe, is everything okay? What's going on? He says, Why are you not getting up? And the Rebbe is thinking, says, I'm thinking. He says, He fell down. He says, I have to think, why did I fall? If I fell, Hashem wanted me to fall. So if Hashem wanted me to fall, I have to think, why did Hashem want me to fall? Rav Sternbach went to give a hespin on one of the Niftarim. And he said that the nifter was a carbon. He was a, a sort of a sacrifice for the for the tzibur, for the for the for the Jewish nation. And we can't understand, we can't fathom the ways of Gadish Baruch Hu. But one thing we have to know clearly, says Rav Shambach, that this terrible tragedy, it's the sound of shofar from above. It's a sort of a, a wake-up call that we have to go and look into our actions. We have to look into our actions. There was a Rav Shimshim Pikas one time went to uh, um, you know, gave, gave uh, Divrei Cyrus uh, words of inspiration after a young girl passed away. And he says that when a tragedy takes place, that's when Hashem's trait of judgment, of din, comes in. And the proper response for us is to arouse ourselves to do tshuva and rectify our deeds. If Hashem is upset, then He's telling us what it is. If He's taking away precious Jews, then he clearly wants something from us. Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach one time went to give uh, to, be, to, uh, uh, to speak to somebody who lost a daughter. And Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach went and he held the hand of the father. And he asked, and he said, those are the father, he says, do you feel my hand? And he says, yes, of course I feel your hand. You're, you're, you're holding my hand. And he says, I see that you're wearing a watch. Rav Shlomo Zaman goes and says, do you feel the watch? And he says, no, no, I, you know, I, I, to be honest, I forgot that I had a watch over there. So, so, so Rav Shem Zaman goes and says, why do you feel the hand, but you don't feel the watch? He says, the answer is, is because you get used to the watch. When you get used to the watch, you don't feel it anymore. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu went and he got hold of you. And he's telling you right now, do not forget that there is a creator. There is a Boel Olam. There is a creator in the world. There is somebody overseeing everything. All these tragedies, there are a voice from heaven. And the first thing that we need to do is Hashem is saying, I am here. I'll go into Rav Chaim Kanievsky. You know, his son wrote up of, of what he went, he went over to his father. And he said, people are asking, what, what do you say? The Gadol Hadar. And Rav Chaim answered and he says, it's a Gzeira Min He says, we're not aware of the Cheshbonis. People ask, why did this happen? Rav Chaim answered, we don't know. It's a Gzeira. We're not aware, we don't know, we're not God's accountant. So they went and they asked him, what do we need to fix? We know that when we have... When you sue and bar on the person, when a person had, goes to suffer, a person has to go, you fast fresh he has to go and he look into his deeds, see what he could do to improve. So I want to share with you a few things based on what the Argadolim are telling us of what we should focus on, what we should work on. This is definitely a time that we should go and we should focus on it. Rav Chaim goes on first and foremost, he says you have to be mechazik b'tayr, you have to go and learn more Torah. We know that Torah is the source of everything. Torah is the source that not only is going to make you a better person, but it's going to tell you how to be a better person. It's going to tell you with Allah of how to serve Hashem. It tells you everything from A to Z. First thing is be strengthening in Hasmadas. Learn more, learn more, focus more on Torah. And he repeated this several times. And then he goes, that's number one. Number two, Rab Chaim goes and he says, a woman should be mechazik b'tzniyas. Woman should go and focus on being more modest. Work, and, work on modesty. Rab Chaim then goes and says that people are not careful enough on the halachas of netila sedayin for suda, washing your hands before you eat a meal in all its detail. Focus on that also. That's number three. Number four, 
Rabbi Chaim Kenevsi goes and says, we also have to be chazak in the Kavana when we say brachos. When we say brachos, we have to go and we have to feel the, the closest of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And in fact, Rabbi Gamliel Rabbi also goes and also speaks also about this. It says also that we have to focus on brachos. When we have a magefa and he calls this a magefa and he says COVID is a magefa, we know that during the times of magefa, David HaMelech went and instituted a hundred brachos per day. We have to go and we have to, when we say brachos, don't double them, just mumble them. Say it. And if you're able to, wait that somebody else is going to be able to answer Amen. Go, I went over to my wife. Was it today or yesterday? I said, from now on, I want that before we make any brachos, that I'm going to go and I'm going to go next to you and you'll say amen and you'll come to me, we'll say amen so we can act, add that extra amen into it. The fifth thing is, Rav Sternbach brings it down, Rav Yaakov Hillel also, the big Mukubal in Eretz Yisrael also brings it down. It says that, you know, during this time, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva died. And what was the reason that they died? The Gemara in Yavamos, page 62b, goes and tells us, they didn't treat each other, they didn't behave towards each other with respect. And Allah Ba'omer, that's when they stopped dying. And you know what they died from? They died from something called Askra. Askra is something that they, they, they were choking, they couldn't breathe. And some say that that's what, you know, COVID, COVID people passed away because they couldn't breathe. Here also, here also, it was so unfortunate. People passed away, they couldn't breathe. The connection is uncanny, it's, it's scary, the connection. And that's where Rav Sternbach and Rav Yaakov Hillel goes and says that during this time, you know what we need to focus on? We need to focus just like the students of Rabbi Kiva. They didn't treat each other with respect. They didn't treat each other. But we have to focus on our interpersonal relationship. And our interpersonal relationship is not only on, you know, our distant relatives or our friends. It's also the, the close relationships with, between our parents, between our spouses, between our children. Whatever it is, we have to be careful. We have to focus on our interpersonal relationship. We have to behave with each other with more respect. Increase the love for one another. Increase the Ahavas Yisrael. Increase the peace, the friendship between each one of us. There was a story that came out also that this person wrote himself, Yaakir Asaraf. He was a secular Israeli. And he was shocked by this Meron tragedy. And he decided he, he had to share with the family's pain, the family's tragedy, a family that lost a loved one. And he decided he's going to go and he's going to go pay a shiva call to the Englard family. They lost not one but two boys during this, during this tragedy. Moshe Nataneta by the age of 14, and Yoshua at the age of 9. And he posted his, you know, his interaction during this thing and this blew up. And he goes and he writes, this Yakir, he goes and he writes, he says, I just experienced one of the most significant, mom significant moments in my life. He says, I, I was bursting with emotions. My eyes were filled with sad tears, but my heart was filled with simcha, with, with happiness. And I, well, let's understand where he's coming from. He goes and he says, there's two, he, he was secular. At, I'm assuming, I don't know, hopefully he's not anymore, but right now he's, uh, he's just two secular guys came to be Menachem Avel in jeans and a t-shirt in a very, very Haredi, very, very religious crowd. And when these two secular people came in, the religious people, look, they, stuck, they, they stood out, and they, the two, two people quickly got up and they let them sit down right in front of Menachem Mendel, the father of these boys. And the father noticed quickly, you know, who's, they're coming, and he stopped speaking Yiddish with the other people that he came, and he turned into, into, uh, into Hebrew. And he goes over to these two secular people who just came to be Menachem Avel, never saw them before in his life. And he goes and he says, I'm so happy that you came. And he said his eyes were wet with tears, but his face was radiant. That's what the, these, these uh, the Yakir is explaining. And, you know, when he was talking, Yakir is saying, says, me and my friend, we were looking at him. And we're thinking that there's an angel speaking to us. And he goes on, the father goes on and says, you should know what's happening here is the truth. He goes, the father goes and says, you and I are both pained by the great loss. But we're giving chizuk to one another. It doesn't matter if you're secular or Haredim, you're or Chilonim, it doesn't matter if you're secular or religious, we're all Jews. And he goes and says, I want you to invite me to your smachot. I want to, the next time you make a smachot, I want you to invite me and I'm going to invite you to the next time I make a happy occasion, a happy celebration. A few minutes of silence go by and he looks down and he mumbles the words, the words that make, they give such nachas to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Those are the words, Mika Amcha Yisrael. Who is like you, the Jewish nation? Who is like you? There's no, look at these two secular people just wanted to come. They had that experience that changed their life. 
change their life. You know why? Because it's unadulterated love. That's what it is. It's just pure love for everybody else. You look during the time of tragedies, you know what happens? It says everybody unites together. Everybody unites together, and that's what's happening. And this is what our, our Gedolim are telling us. This is what we need to focus on. We need to focus on it for unadulterated love. Stop hating. Stop having jealousy. Stop going and hating. And if you have these issues, pray for it. Go, and this leads us to the next thing. Our final thing that I, that the, you know, I wanted to speak about what our Gedolim are telling us to work on, and that is tefillah. The Gemara in Sukkah, page 52a, goes and says there are seven names for the Yetzirah Hara, for the evil inclination. One of that names is Evan, stone. That if a person goes day by day and lives day by day out of habit as a lev of an Evan, a lev, a stony heart, he doesn't feel anything. He's missing one of the greatest lessons in life. So what happens is that Hashem sends, unfortunately, Yisurim suffering. And the purpose is to stir the motion into people. Yisurim make a person think. And, and, and it sort of wakens us. How many, when we go and we start davening, how much of our davening is emotion filled? Or how much is it we're just like a robot and we're saying things that we need to? Another thing that we need to focus on over here is when we, when we go and we stand in front of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, Rav Yaakov El-El says, put away your phone, get rid of the phone. Focus on the prayer. Realizing in who you're standing in front of. You're standing in front of Melech, Malcham, Lachim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're standing in front of God. Stop, work a little bit. You have so much emotion bottled up. Turn that into tefillah. Work on your tefillah. Work on the aspect of when you're talking, concentrate a little bit. Know what you're saying. Know what you're dealing with. There's so many things that, that we could improve. But our Gedolim told us these things. Again, there's a few others, but these are the ones that, that I decided I wanted to focus on. And the reason is, this is the ones that I saw uh, you know, across the board. These are the ones that really we really should focus on it. And just, of, just as a quick recap, we said tefillah. We really should focus on tefillah. And we should focus on the interpersonal relationship. The Rabbi Kiva student died from suffocation, just like what, unfortunately, this story happened. And unfortunately, what's been happening for the past year and a half with COVID. It says we should focus on loving your friend like yourself. Baseless love. That's what we should focus on. Also, we should focus on the brachos, when we say the brachos. Also, for netilas yadayim, when we go and we focus on the suda, as Rabbi Chaim Kenevsky goes and says. And finally, for the woman, sneers, and for the men, learning hasmada b'tayra. You know, when we go into these type of tragic events, it starts thinking, like, you know, does God, God hate us? Like, what's going on over here? The Pasuk of Devarim, chapter 8, verse 5, goes and says, V'yadata im levavecha, you shall know in your heart. When a man chastises, rebukes, gives musr, and, and tries to fix his son, that's Hashem Elkech HaMiyasrecha. Your Hashem, Hashem, your God, is going and chastising you just like a father gives musar to his son. That's God giving us musar. So the question goes, and people ask me, like, wait a minute. I know what love is. I love my child. I love my daughter. I love my son more than anything in the world. I would never do that to them. Why is God doing this? Why are there tragedies? Why, where is Hashem's love? Now imagine there was a, you know, a person sitting down to eat dinner with his wife and family and children. And suddenly a bunch of thugs break into the, into the house. They tie, a, they tie them up and they start you know, ransacking in the, the entire house. And suddenly his neighbor comes in with a cape, dun, 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 you know, comes in, beats them all up, and the thugs run away and the neighbor saves the day. How grateful, how happy are the, is the family going to be to this neighbor? They're going to be forever grateful. But then they find out that the neighbor staged the whole thing. The neighbor arranged the whole thing to happen. He paid the robbers to come in, and he paid them to be able to get beat up so that his neighbor would go and, 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 and respect him, or whatever it is that he, that he did it. So when we go, and, and we think about it, but like, like Agadish Baruch Hu went, and he sent this to us, and then he took his things out, out of us. Like, why are we great? Like, like, what's going on over here when we're dealing with suffering, when we're dealing with tragedies? We know that Akadish Baruch Hu sent that, and we can't figure out why. How is that love? And then we go, and Akadish Baruch Hu takes us out of that suffering for however Akadish Baruch Hu does that. And we thank Akadish Baruch Hu, but the question is why? Akadish Baruch Hu sent us the suffering to begin with. And the answer is that when you look at throughout the Jewish history, you look at all the people that antagonize us, that, that, that you know, persecuted us, that, that went really against us. You look at the Greeks. What happens if they wouldn't have been Greeks that went against the Jewish nation? We would have become like Greeks. And in fact, that's what was happening. There was Hellenization. There was people becoming Hellenized, becoming more like Greeks. There was assimilation. 
Haman. There was would have been would have been tr- tr- you know tremendous amount of, of spiritual loss. If Paro wouldn't have been paranoid about the Jews, the Jews would have became Egyptians. So the truth is, is that yes, Hashem loves us more than we could ever imagine, more than we could even think to love our own children. And we have to know, we have to know in our heart that HaKadosh Baruch Hu treasures us just like a parent treasures, treasures a child. And you know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu? HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a reason. And a child might not always agree with his father's decision. And he might think even that his father hates him, but that's only because he doesn't understand his father. The world is almost 6,000 years old, and there's a plan to the world. Hashem has all the information, the past, the present, the future. And we don't know, like, anything. <laughs> we, don't, we know nothing. We know absolutely nothing. We know zero. So how can we go and start complaining and saying we don't know? We don't know the plan. Yes, it's a tragedy. Yes, we're mourning. Yes, we're going and we're... It hurts us. And yes, we're going to fix us. But why a loving father would do this, we don't know. But one thing we know is there's a loving father. And that doesn't change that fact. That judge doesn't change that fact. Rabbi Damir brings down the story that Baal Shem was, was five years old. And people were talking about his amazing wisdom. And it came to the count. And the count heard that this boy has amazing, amazing wisdom. The count says, a five-year-old has such wisdom? I want to test him. He says, Tell the boy to come to, the ca- to, to this castle. And the boy approaches the castle, and he notices there's no guards. There's no nobody. The door is open, and he starts walking in. And he's looking, nobody's around. And it didn't take long until he found the count. He found the count was hiding in one particular room, and he found it. And the count goes over to him and says, tell me, how did you find me? He says, what I did was, is I wanted to test your wisdom. So I told, I said, nobody's around. Nobody's allowed to be around. I sent all my guards, all my servants, everybody home. He says, it was just me and this entire castle. And you found me so quick. I says, I want to know how you did it. And the boy says, they're very simple. He says, I was walking to the castle. I was looking at the castle. And I noticed every window was open. Oh, you were letting the ear come in. He says, one window shade was closed. He says, I realized that the window shade that's closed must be someone's, must be someone's in there. And, he's, and he says, that's exactly what it was. I sent everybody out and I closed the window shade because I wanted to spy on you. I wanted to see how long it will take for you. Years later, the Baal Shem Tov goes and explains. He says, whenever someone's going through a hard time and he feels that the curtains of Shemayim, the curtains of heaven, the curtains of God is closed. Where is God? God? That's exactly when God's watching you. Just like this little boy, he realized that the count is watching him. How? Because that's the only curtain that was closed. So too, when we go through tragedies, when we go through suffering, that is when Hashem is watching over us even closer. During the Holocaust, many people ask, you know, did God forget about us? And we, we know, as it says in the Pasuk in Shaya, chapter 40, verse 28, it says, Ain cheker we, we, we can't even fathom his understanding. We can't even fathom what HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, like HaKadosh Baruch Hu's plans or anything, you know, along those lines. But the people thought that, you know, during the Holocaust, many people lost their Muna. They came in religious, they left not religious. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, this is not correct. This is not historically correct. Because if you look at the people that lost their Muna, and they became weak, because I, I, had a, I had a, got a question. The question was, what, how do people come out of this? People that are weak in Muna, how do they come out of it? And people, like, let's say they said, like, this is Hashem, this is the Jewish nation, this is what happens when people go to a kosher place, and this, and they try to do the ruts in Hashem, and this is what happens? I'm done with it. Just like it was in the Holocaust. It says, what, because I'm Jewish, I'm going per- to get thrown into concentration camps? Do I need this? The people, if you look at the, historically in the Holocaust, the people that gave up their Muna, the people that went off, and again, we're not judging anybody. But the research was that people that lost their Muna, that threw off the yoke of Judaism, generally, generally, there was nothing to begin with when they, when they came into the Holocaust. But as soon as there was an excuse to throw off all of faith, they looked for it, they found it, and they threw it off. It's unfor- the eagle is the same thing. The Eir of Rav, they were looking for a reason to go and serve Avodah Zarah. They saw an opportunity, they jumped on it. 
But the, the, you know, the, the children of Levi, the children of Levi, they, they were so dedicated to Hashem, it didn't even occur to them. It wasn't even like that. It didn't even, like, it wasn't something that was even a habit, you know, a reason even to go into, um, uh, you know, to, to throw away religion. When you look at people in the Holocaust, people in generally speaking, and this is from, from what I've read and what I've learned, and this is not my own saying, this is from a big rabbi that said this, that people that left the fold, generally speaking, there was, they were not so much part of the fold to begin with. They saw an excuse, they were like, I'm done with it. Again, we're not judging. But when you look at people and they decide, you know what, this is what God, I have nothing to do with it. I've spoken to people and be like, you know why I'm not religious? Because there's starving people in the world. Because there's world hunger. That's why, how could God allow children to die? That's why they leave religion. It's like, that's not why you left religion. Since so you care about these children, when's the last time you fed an African child? When was the last time that you went and you did something? You saw an excuse, you took it, and you decided this is the reason why you want to leave it. But really, you wanted to leave from the beginning. So people of weak faith, they go and they say, you know what, like, why should I even deal with this? But like, no, 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 don't take this as an excuse. You had a preconception, you had an idea already beforehand, and this just wanted to point you in that direction. If you really want to look, look at the people that lost family members. You look at it, you look at the stories, look at what's going on with the stories that are coming out. People that lost their own family, their own children. It doesn't look like they went down in their Muna. They went up. They said, this is Min Hashemayim. this is what Hashem wanted. Not only that, they're even comforting other people. People are going and be like, it's my fault that your son died. Be like, no, it's not. This is from Hashem. Meaning that even for the people, you know what a person should do if a person has a weak level of emuna, Learn from the people who, pass, who actually passed away from their family members. Look at how they're dealing with it. Mika Amka Yishol, look at the growth. A 10-year-old boy, a 10-year-old boy is, has a level of emunah that that's, we could only wish to dream on. He goes and he says his brother died, he says it was meant to be. This is what Hashem wanted. This is what God wanted. Now the Zohar in Bechukotai goes and says that, Hashem, the, the, how beloved are the children of, of, of Israel before HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That Hashem desires to give them Musa, to give, bring them back, like a loving father. You know, Rav Shach told the story, you know, in the name of Rav Isazam and Meltzer. He says one time there was a father who was walking through the woods and with his son, and he told his son, he says, don't drift away, stay very close to me. Stay very, very close to me. And the son, you know, tried to, he got curious, saw some cool flowers or an animal, whatever it was, he started drifting off. And he went off the path. And he, he couldn't find his father. And he was trying to search for thought. The more, the more that he searched, the more lost that he got. And he, felt, he started, you know, getting really scared. You're by yourself in the forest, you hear noises. If anybody has ever walked in the forest by themselves, you hear a twig, you, you jump. And later you realize you're the one that caused it. Or you jump at a squirrel, you jump at anything. And this boy was jumping, he was so scared. And who knows, wolves, lion, who knows what's going on over here. Suddenly he feels a very strong pain across his cheek. He turns out, and before he can even cry, he sees his father gave him a smack on his face. This is, I guess, before when, when people are allowed to be mechanic their children. He goes and gives him a smack in the face. I shouldn't have said that. All right, whatever. Ignore I said that. Well, <laughs> different, different topic for a different time. Um, he gives, the father gives him a smack in the face. And the boy turns around, he sees his father, instead of crying, instead of getting upset and angry that why did you slap me, he got so happy, he got a cry of joy, he says, my father, my father, he gave a big hug, he said, my father slapped me, I'm so happy. He says, when Hashem loves you, he gives you a little smack, he says, guides you us to the right direction. He says, but the fact that we got this, don't think that Hashem hates us. Yes, we have to reprove. Hashem loves us because if Hashem hates us, if Hashem didn't care care about us, then Hashem wouldn't send any messages. It wouldn't have been, it would just, you know, left it as it is. Who cares? If you don't care about somebody, you don't send any messages. But the fact that we got messages and the fact that we get messages and the fact that we consistently get messages, that means that God loves us. It means that God wants us. He wants us to come close to Him. When a father cares about a child, a father is going to reprove this child, give him musal. Give him chizuk. If a father doesn't care and gave up on the child, he's not going to bother with this child anymore. Rav Menachem Biderman goes and says that in the Tuchacha, written in this week's parasha, and, and this, the, the Tuchacha goes and brings down a girl in parashat Kisavo. And the, in this week's parasha, there's some words of comfort of, of Nechama. And it says, 
you know, in, in uh, chapter 26, verse 44, it says, And even when you're going to be in the land of your enemies, I will not despise them. Speaking about the Jewish nation, I will not reject them and I will not, and I will, I will not an annihilate them. And there's, there's words of comfort even in the words of rebuke. But when we speak about the words of rebuke in Parashat Kitavo, there's no comforting words. So the question is why? Why in this week's parashah there's comforting words, but in the other parashah in Kisavo there's no comforting words? And there's another difference. And in parashat Kisavo it goes and it tells us that Hashem, we see Hashem's name appears in the rebuke. It, it Hashem, you see Hashem's name in it. In this week's parashah there's no mention in it. There's no mention of Hashem's name. The Chassam Sofer goes and answers that in parashat Kisavo the Tochacha doesn't need any comforting. You want to know why? Because there's the, the Hashem's in there. There's the name of Hashem in there. Because once you realize there's Hashem in there, and you realize that everything is coming from Hashem, then you have the comfort. But in this week's parasha, Hashem's name isn't mentioned in it. And if Hashem's name isn't mentioned in it, therefore we need to be comforted. Because once we know that Hashem is in the picture, we get comforted. And you want to know, moving out of this, yes, we have to go and we have to fix ourselves. And oh yes, we have a long list of, of, of things that we need to do, and each one knows what they need to fix themselves. Preferably focus on the things that the Gedolim told us to fix on. But we also have to know something very, very, very important. That Hashem loves us. And this is a proof for it. People go and say, this is Hashem hates us. Be like, no, 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 you're getting it all wrong. If you got a slap from somebody, that means that they love you. You know what? how you know that there's a good friend? How do you know that you have a good friend? When a friend tells you you're doing something wrong. I have people that call me up and they ask me questions for their friend. And no, sometimes it really is for their friend. And they're asking and they're saying, what am I supposed to tell my friend? If my friend is doing this. I had a question, my friend, you know, somebody asked that my friend's dating an Anju. And they want to do a certain thing, be like, tell them they're not allowed to date an Anju. They wanted to know if they're allowed to get married at a certain time. Forget about that. Forget about what they're allowed. Tell them that they're not allowed to go in there. They're like, no, I can't say that. They're like, wait a minute. Why not? Why can't you guide your friend to the right direction? Do you love your friend? Do you care about your friend? When you go and you love somebody, that also means that you have to go and, and if there's some, some, something wrong, again, I'm not saying go and give, start giving Musa to everybody else. I'm not saying that, but if there's something wrong, if you love somebody, you will try to fix them. If you love somebody that's going and doing drugs and destroying their life, you of course you would try to help them. So, so too, if someone is going and destroying their spiritual life, are you not going to try to help them? Maybe you can't, so maybe you connect them with a rabbi who could. Maybe you could do something for them. So yes, we have to focus on what we need to fix. But don't forget, don't forget about the fact that you have a loving Father in heaven. And this doesn't say that Hashem doesn't love us, but it says that Hashem loves us even more. Hashem is telling us, I need you, I want you to be close to me. You're not where you need to be. Come close to me. Come close to me. And really with this, we really have to... You know, pray for, the, you know, the call said that we have to pray for Mashiach. Really that the, the, the parents should be reunited with their children very soon. The, the wives should be reunited with their spouses. Students with their rabbis. We have lost so many good people. So many good people. Oh, do we need Mashiach. Oh, do we need Mashiach now, right? Can we go and we daven a little bit? I this Rachel, please. Give us Mashiach. So the bracha is that may we have really the guy that said that we have Mashiach coming and may all who lost be reunited with their family and we'll open up for some questions. Okay. Um, first question over here. If davening creates a connection between you and the one you're davening for, is it wrong to daven for someone in the opposite gender? Okay, so I think the question is like this. So I think the question is that is when you go and you want to daven for somebody. So this is something actually I tell, let's say somebody doesn't like somebody else and they want to start liking this person. So one of the things that I tell them to do is daven for that person's success. Because then you'll start getting some sort of close attachment, you're davening for the success of this person. So what happens if let's say there's somebody in the opposite de gender and you're davening for, but when you're davening for somebody the opposite gender, it's causing you to go and uh, to have some sort of connection. And maybe it's not good for you to have this emotional connection. Maybe, uh, I don't know, whatever, you know, you should be focused on your spouse. Or maybe you're not married yet and maybe you shouldn't be focused on the opposite gender. So the real answer for this is, is really depends on what's going on over here. If, if it's, you know, I, I can't say don't daven for anybody. You're supposed to daven for the entire Kalali Israel. But if it causes in some sort of a emotional response in your mind to go to feel something that you shouldn't feel, then maybe instead of 
not davening for that person. You have to think, think about it. Why are you having these emotions? Why are you having these thoughts? So it's hard for me to give you a straight out answer because sometimes, you know, maybe, maybe yes, maybe you have to take that person away from your mind because it's affecting your other relationships. It's affecting your spouse. It's affecting how you're dealing with. So it really depends on a case by case basis and the reason for it and what is the reason for it. So I can't say don't stop davening. I can't say continue stop davening. It just depends on the situation. So you can reach out to me, the person who asked this, and we could deal about it. And depending on the situation, maybe you should continue, maybe you should change something, and maybe you should stop. I don't know. We have to deal the case by case basis. Okay. Next question is which Torah topics should girls focus on more than boys and vice versa? So, uh, you know, it's when you're dealing on, on, uh, on what Torah topics that you, you should focus on. The answer is the ones that apply to you day to day. So if let's say you're dealing with halakhot, you should focus on the halakhot that deal with the woman. If it's a boy, focus on what deals with the boy. Uh, and I can't, you know, first of all, first and foremost, halakhot is of utmost importance. That, that's like the, you know, the top of the list. That's, you have to know what to do. You want to be a good Jew, you have to know what to do. But hashkafa is something that is also extreme importance because then it's what you do when you're doing it, your emotions and your feeling behind it. Generally, the topics that we speak about is more in the hashkafic aspect of it. That is, you have to know the, the halakha aspect of it, and then when we speak about the hashkafa, that, that puts more of emotion and it puts you on a different level. So you should really focus on the things that you need to as your gender, uh, or whatever is your gender. So uh, for, for women in, gen, in general, it's, um, you know, tzniut is very important. Lush and Hara is also very important to learn how we speak, uh, learn how we, you know, chesed type of things. There, there are a lot of topics that are very, very apropos for a woman, and that's what you should really uh, focus on, how to raise your children, how to deal with your husband. There's a lot of things that are focused, you know, and I can't say primarily because it's really for the husband and for men as well, but there are things that are more generated towards women. That's the first answer. The second answer is what topic you should focus on is a topic that you enjoy. The topic that you enjoy the most, focus on that, because that's where you can really tap into that and you can really grow from that. Okay, next question. Uh, that which applies to them, including the day-to-day -day life, and then obviously, oh, okay, never mind. That was an answer <laughs> to the previous question. Thank you. Okay, it looks like the last question. If anybody has any questions, you could, um, you could type it in. If we know of a fake convert who's going to marry a Jew, who knows she's a fake convert, what is the obligation to stop it? Okay, so I'm assuming the guy is a, from this, from this question, I'm assuming that the guy is a fake convert. Again, I don't know what that means, fake. I'm assuming that he, he converted but not legitimately. And if he converted not legitimately and, he, and she's marrying him, I'm assuming they're not religious. Oh, she converted. Okay, uh, so if, some, if someone converted and it wasn't a real conversion, do we have to go... Do we have an obligation to say, listen, you're marrying an Anjou? And the answer is yes. I mean, uh, the easiest way to, to deal with this is to call up the rabbi who's officiating the wedding and, know, and notify them that the conversion is not a legitimate conversion or whatever your concern is. Generally speaking, when a rabbi, again, I'm assuming we're talking about an orthodox you know, um, rabbi, when a rabbi is marrying the, um, the couple, Especially when there's a convert, the rabbi looks into it. The rabbi who's officiating, who's Masada Kedushan, goes and looks into um, making sure that there was, the conversion was legitimate and the conversion, conversion stands. So what an easy way to do is to reach out to the rabbi and say, listen, this is what the, the situation is and uh, may, you, know, you should really look into it. Uh, more than that is something that uh, you should really... Uh, go and, and speak to the person that you know, like, you know, this is something that's, that's wrong. Yes, absolutely, you should go and you should speak to them, say that it's wrong, you shouldn't be happening, this is not your soul. Whatever it is that you could, you know, speak to them, absolutely you should speak to them. This is, a, you know, assimilation is, is, is one of the worst things. They, they, they cut, get cut off from the Jewish nation. The rest of the, especially you're dealing with the girl is not Jewish, the rest of the, you know, the kids coming out of there, they're, they're not Jewish anymore. So definitely, definitely you could do a lot. And if you want to speak more, we could speak about it offline. You could call me and we could uh, discuss it. Uh, next question that came up is, how can I control my thoughts? So that is a great, great question. We spoke about this topic a while back. Um, I believe, I believe, don't quote me on this. I'm trying to remember. It may have been in the 13 Principles of Faith series where we spoke about how is one supposed to control their thoughts? So I would recommend to go and look at, listen to that whole class because there's a lot to speak about it. But 
the question is a very good question because we can't control our thoughts. Our thoughts are fleeting thoughts. I mean, just pop in the head. I could say a rock full of fire rolling down a hill. You're right now thinking of a rock flaming with fire rolling down a hill. Like I just put things in and you're going to think about it. And I could say, don't think of a sheep on fire jumping rope. And you're probably thinking right now of a sheep on fire jumping rope somehow. So the question is, how do we go and we control it? So the Shemish Mul does bring down a, a concept of this. He brings it down in the Mimer on Shavuos. And he goes and he says that we generally, our, our thoughts are not in our mind, you know, are not in our control, it's in the God's control. So what is in our control? Our actions. Our actions are in our, um, in our control. So what we, we need to focus on is we need to focus on the, our actions, what we could do. And once we focus on our actions, God will sort of grant us, the Shem Mishmol goes and explains, grant us the power of control over our thoughts. Meaning that if we don't have control over something, B, but we have control over something A, then focus on controlling your A. And what do we have? We have control over our actions. Focus on your action, and with that, you will gain control over your, um, over your thoughts. Okay, we have another uh, question over here. Can you speak about the Aguna crisis issue? So I, I would ask to clarify on what in particular, that you're right, it is. Um, but again, what exactly, you know, it, it's a terrible situation, but what exactly is uh, the, the question on? Um, okay, uh, well, I guess that was, it. it was another Hi Rabbi Outstanding, powerful shir. As always, thank you, Baruch Hashem. I have a lot of friends that has a lot of suffering. Unfortunately, um, the, oh, perfect, thank you. And someone just posted on controlling the thoughts. There's a link over there. Thank you very much. Um, it's unfortunate. It's, you know, there's some times where people are going through a lot of suffering and we really have to be there for them. And, you know, it's, it's easy to live in our own lives, especially if we weren't affected by, by something. It's easy, but we really have to, you know, we're all one nation. We're all one part of one Klal Yisrael. And if one person's hurting, we're all hurting. And if you don't feel that way, then try to contemplate a little bit. Try, I know it's hard. I know it's hard if you never met somebody before in your life, but really try to focus a little bit and try to feel the pain. And if you can't, what I, I would recommend is, you know, if you really want to feel part of this, tune, well, now it's too late, but if you tuned into any of the funerals, any of the levias of the people that passed away, or if you listen to any of the, you go on, let's say, you, you hear even the, the, the story that I mentioned about Kobe, and you, you hear him speaking about it, you can't stop swelling up with emotion. So if you can't go and you can't feel connected to Klaus, open yourself up over there. People want to like, I don't want to deal with it. It's going to make me sad. They're like, no, you should be a little bit sad. This is your brothers and sisters, even though they're not related to you. We're all one nation. If they're suffering, we're also suffering. And if you have, we have to feel a, a something, at least something we're feeling. We're suffering with the pain of our brothers, pain of our sisters. But with that, um, with that, oh, hold on one second, we have another. Okay, here we have a person, she does a lot of mitzvot, constantly feeding the poor, giving tzedakah, name it, she does it. Yet her father passed, her kids are constantly in the hospital, her husband nonstop. Any advice you could offer, it's greatly appreciated. So let's say, I guess the question, let's make it more generic. Let's say somebody's going through a tremendous amount of suffering, one after another. What can a person do to alleviate that suffering? So again, we do have, uh, we did give a class on it, how to prevent suffering. It's in the Muna series. It's in the beginning. One of the first 15 classes is, uh, you know, I speak about it. And that's, that's more in, in detail on it. But the simple concept, the, the simple understanding we have to realize is that we, we don't know why it's happening. So a lot of people go and they say, you know what, if you give more stuck if you give more mice, if you give more this, if you give more that, then the suffering is going to go away. We don't know. Uh, and I can't tell you yes or no. I'm not God's accountant. Nobody's God's accountant. So we don't know what, what is happening. But one thing we do know is that Chazal tell us that if somebody sees that suffering is coming upon themselves, you should go and look into their deeds. And you can tell me they look into their deeds. They're doing everything right. And I, I can't tell I don't know. You know, focus on more. I can't tell you why, what, how, when, where, you know, it's happening. I don't know. But we have to go and we always have to, if bad things are happening, first thing is we have to improve. Second thing that I would tell, and this is so difficult, so difficult to, to, you know, to say, is the concept of acceptance. 
if God sent it to us, we have to go and we have to accept it. And, and that itself has a tremendous amount of power of Yeshua, of, of salvation. So uh, we can focus on that. The, the third thing that I would say is, is please, please, please make sure, let her speak to some sort of rabbi, give her some sort of guidance. Even if the rabbi can't tell anything, at least the rabbi could go and give her some sort of consolation and speak to her and give her some sort of chizuk. It seems like she's going through a lot of a hardship of this, this person. So let her speak to somebody to go and to, um, and, you know, to, to guide her on, on this. Um, and then we have the question, I, I'm assuming came back on the Aguna, on the Aguna situations, what we can do about it, what can be done about it. And that is a very, very heavy question that has a lot, a lot to discuss. There are certain rabbis that are, before they marry somebody, they, they include a certain clause now because of that. But I think what can really be done, you know, about what is really the prevention more, um, prevented from happening in the future and really dealing with, you know, relationship things. Before a person, um, before a person goes and and gets married they really need to go and understand you know the relation and they're going through troubling time and hard time they have to go to the therapist can't tell you how many couples you know have come and they they, they about on the brink of divorce but they never once went to get help and they need to go and they need to get help and they need to go and, and listen to the help so you want to know what really should be done about it is people really need to be educated on proper relationship and if sometimes marriages don't work out that's fine not, you know, I mean, that's not, I can't say it's fine, but it's not, obviously not fine, but it's um, something that needs to, uh, uh, you know, needs to be focused on, on the prevention aspect. I think they'll have a lot more power than, than, uh, than focusing after the fact. But the question is, is that what is the Aguna crisis? So Aguna is somebody, is, let's say a woman got married to a man and they separated, but the man refuses to give her a bill of divorce, a get. So she cannot go on with her life because she can't get the bill of divorce. So, it, it, you know, it's a crisis because there are certain, you know, people, unfortunately, it seems like they're not 100%, you know, correct in their mindset. And they decide they want their wife, ex-wife, whatever you want to call it, to suffer. And, and therefore, they don't give them a, uh, a bill of divorce. So there's pressure that gets put on them from the community. And, you know, things are getting done by it, but this, that's not for the topic of this, uh, of this class. Definitely doesn't uh, correlate to the, you know, to the situation that we're dealing with right now. Um, I would like to keep it on a separate, uh, you know, separate topic and not deal too much on this because really the focus really is for the, uh, the people that, you know, the suffering, the hardships that went on in Meron and, you know, deal with one hardship at a, you know, at a time. And right now the focus really is on, is, is really on that and I want to keep it on that. But that is, in short, the, you know, the, the Aguna, I guess you could call it, uh, crisis. In any case, it looks like that was the last message. Um, what can we say? What can we say we can't get off? That we shouldn't know any more of the suffering. We shouldn't really know any more of the pain. All those who lost loved ones, uh, you know, should only have nechama, consolation from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We should only know good things. And Be'ezat Hashem, may we be able to greet Mashiach b'mehera b'amenu very, very quickly and be reunited with all those that we lost, unfortunately. Hazak Have an amazing Shabbat, an amazing, amazing week.